We are proud members of the Spy Podcast Network. Find out more at www.spypodcasts.com. Saddle up and welcome to Spy Hard's podcast, where your hosts go deep undercover into the world of spy movies to decipher which films make the knock list. But remember, this information is strictly for your ears only. I'm Agent Scott. And I'm Cam the Provocateur, wearing a yellow stripe down my back. What was it? What's the word they use for people in this film? Was it copperback? Yellow copperback. I had to look it up. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I had to look up a lot of things for this film. <laughs> Were you having like flashbacks to like British agent where you're looking up the history of like Russian Revolution? <laughs> yeah, I, I was not a history major. <laughs> Let's put it that way. And this is also very American history in this movie, so I can understand that. It you don't nice. say. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, say, can you say? <laughs> Whenever, when I, I'm begging you now, when I do the letterbox.com synopsis, mm. can you have the Star Spangled Banner playing in the background? Oh, it's not the Star Spangled Banner they're playing underneath everything. It's the, um, I've got it written down here. It is the Battle Hymn of the Republic. That's the music they're playing. Yeah, it's the Glory, Glory, Hallelujah song. Sure. Well, um, we've taken the mickey out of it already, Cam, but what on earth are we talking about this week? We are talking about 1952's Springfield Rifle, starring Gary Cooper. I didn't have an absolute clue what this film was, I have to say. I mean, most people listening will not be shocked by that information. Cam? Uh, I had never heard of this one. I've watched a fair number of Gary Cooper films, including Gary Cooper Westerns. Um, so I'm familiar with the guy's work, um, but this one I had not come across. It is, to be fair, a bit of an obscurity. Well, which is weird because like, I think the director's quite well known for Westerns as well. Like, It's kind of the perfect mix of people. Yeah, the director, we'll talk about him with the behind the scenes, but... He made a fair number of westerns, not a lot of classic westerns. So, okay. yeah, his his best known credit was actually the Vincent Price movie House of Wax, um, which is one of those horror classics of the era. But in terms of his westerns, he made a lot of, I think, you know, successful ones, but not a lot of all time classics. Well, if you're anything like us and don't have an absolute clue what this film is about, here is your letterbox.com synopsis and fair warning. You may have to saddle your horse, cock your gun, and be ready for a long ride. Okay, I'm strapped in. Let's do this. Springfield Rifle. The gun, the girl. They made one man the equal of five. Major Lex Kearney, dishonorably discharged from the army for cowardice in battle, volunteers to go undercover to try to prevent raids against shipments of horses desperately needed for the Union war effort. Falling in with the gang of Jayhawkers and Confederate soldiers who have been conducting the raids, he gradually gains their trust and is put in a position where he can discover who has been giving them top secret information revealing the routes of the horse's shipment. <laughs> yeah, okay. That's the movie. It is the movie. I do like right up front in the tagline, the girl... I'm like, uh, I don't know that I'd be putting her in the tagline of the movie. I don't know that her importance is uh, <laughs> particularly strong. Well, I'll probably get to that in my dislikes later on in the film. But like, yeah. it's even she's even in the poster. Yeah, I mean, it's the era. You're, it's sure. It's a studio saying we want to also market to women. Um, here's a here's a character <laughs> right on your poster. You know, women come to the movie as well. So it, she it's... has no agency unless her husband's around. Women, you'll love this. <laughs> it's it's very cynical marketing, but it makes sense within 1952 for sure. Sure. Okay. Um. Yeah. I I also don't know what the Jayhawker is. Oh, that was okay. So <laughs> that's a term. There's a part where the horse thieves in this movie are referenced as they are not Southern soldiers. Um, they are not with the Confederate Army. They are 
dropouts, and I think they say no good Knicks and things like that. Um, I think they would be the Jayhawkers. They kind of operate in the middle and are um, shifting the horses back and forth. Wasn't that the alternate title for this podcast? Jayhawkers? No, no good Knicks. <laughs> oh, no good Knicks? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, right, so we have a definition for Jayhawkers, but... Um... It's also interesting in the sense of this might be the only time we've ever had, or will ever have, a Western spy film. That's true. Um, I just want to say, I looked it up, uh, Jay Hawker. Here, I will read the actual definition. Oh, it says, a native or resident of Kansas, used as a nickname, meaning two, often capitalized a member of a band of anti-slavery guerrillas in Kansas and Missouri before and during the American Civil War. And then another meaning, bandits. So That's confused me even more. I'll go with bandits. That's probably the easiest thing. Because it, uh, there's some geopolitical and historical questions I have for you that hopefully you can answer. If you can't, then maybe we'll just have to throw it out to everyone else in the world. But um, yeah, I, we have no background like in with this film personally. So I guess I'll throw it to you, Cam, if you have any information on how this film came to be. Oh, I have some. Um, this is not a movie with a uh, rich backstory in terms of its development and whatever. So the story for this film was by a man named Sloan Nibley. That's not a name you hear so often nowadays. Um, he'd gotten his you know earlier start in Hollywood in the 40s. He'd done a movie called Wake Island, which I've seen. It's a World War II propaganda film. Um, and then he just started working westerns and made a whole bunch of westerns, including one called Carson City that he wrote the screenplay for in 1952. Um, that film we will touch back on shortly. So um, that story was based around the, um, the Springfield rifle, which was manufactured by the Springfield Armory in Springfield, Massachusetts. And it uh, was the model 1861, which, depending on which historian you want to believe, was, uh, you know, played a significant factor in the Union winning the Civil War. Now, the script for this film was developed by two men. Uh, one of them was Charles Marquis Warren, who was a writer, director, made a lot of westerns, not a lot of notable film westerns, but he would go on to create the TV shows Rawhide, The Virginian, and Gunsmoke. Um, at least two of those, like among the most iconic western TV shows of all time. So um, this is definitely someone with some pedigree in the future this is him kind of i think finding his voice and he's going to create a lot of very iconic television the other writer was a man named frank davis who began his uh, work as a writer producer he made a lot of spanish films um, before um, mo writing movies like uh, in 1927 he made a movie called california and he you go through his filmography there's not a lot of real name value now but he did write a um, film called The Story of Will Rogers, and it's notable mostly because um, well, it was a biopic, but it was also directed by Michael Curtiz, who we talked about for British Agent. He was a very prolific director at the time. And um, honestly, like um, Frank Davis mostly went to TV at a certain point. And uh, he did have one credit, though, that's notable in the 60s. Near the end of his career, he wrote the Burt Lancaster thriller The Train, which is a fantastic film. I recommend people check it out. Now, the director of this film was Andre de Toth. He was an Austrian-born director who, um, in the mid-30s, started taking on various odd jobs in the Hungarian film industry. And then, you know, as the kind of the dawn and the build-up to World War II was happening, he fled first to England, pre-war, and then headed to the U.S. in 1942. And one of his first jobs was working in second unit, he um, worked on the 1942 version of Jungle Book, which is a really fun adventure film. Uh, and then he just went into uh, writing and directing. And writing, he was sparse. Like, he, he did a number of things, but that's not where his focus was. He was primarily a director. But he did write the 1950 um, film The Gunfighter with Gregory Peck, which I watched very, like, recently, like, maybe, like, three weeks ago and it's a phenomenal film it's on the criterion collection one if you like westerns i really recommend people check out the gunfighter um and so he had a story credit for that when he came up with the concept and uh he began directing with a movie called wedding in Topran in the 30s and then just he made a string of westerns um not a lot that are remembered but um he made a lot with the uh, actor randolph scott 
who was a big Western actor at the time. One of those films was Carson City, which had, of course, a screenplay by, going back, Slow Nibley, who had the story credit on this film. So that's probably where those two guys connected. Nibley. <laughs> I know. <laughs> Slow Nibley. <laughs> that's all I'm taking away from that is Nibley. Okay, here's the question about the name Slow Nibley. Birth name or, like, pseudonym? Did he create that name? That's an interesting question because you've got to think, like, what do you want to do with your, your pseudonym, your, like, Hollywood name? You won't forget Slow Nibbly. Never. I just <laughs> I just met Slow Nibbly, guys, and boy, like, whoa. That's and, right. I mean, I, I, I forget Gary Cooper, forget Springfield Rifle. In a year's time when I'm posting on Instagram about, you know, the one-year anniversary of Springfield Rifle coming out, I'm just going to write Slow Nibbly, Slow Nibbly, Slow Nibbly. <laughs> Save that for the wrap-up for 2022 podcast. <laughs> <laughs> um. Well, I I do just want to wind us back a little bit, unless you had featured plan to feature this further in your history of the film. Now, one of the things I think we're going to discuss in the review is the Civil War. Yeah, in America, and we did study it slightly as part of like the uh, the the expansion of the West from from England because it sort of stems from Europe heading over to the Americas, I suppose. Um, but we didn't really focus too much on the Civil War itself. So my knowledge of who is who, what faction won, uh, really is lacking. I went and watched like a 20-minute YouTube video to try and get my head around it before we did this review. Yeah. So just, just to, I, I, I assume you know a bit more because you're in North America, though. Yeah, I mean, I, I've definitely watched a lot of films and stuff about the Civil War. So I, I kind of know my basics, I would say. But is it taught to you in school? Excellent question. Probably, but my memory of what I actually learned in like high school is very thin. I mean, yes, you did go to school, you know, a very long time ago. That's true. I mean, back in those days, it was just like the school marm teaching us. You know, it was a long time ago. But like, I feel like they probably gave us an overview of the Civil War, but it would have been brief. I remember more of them teaching us about World War II. Um, yes, we well, we had tons of that, but that's par for the course when it comes to Britain. Every other sentence is about the war. I suppose my question to you is then, Gary Cooper's character, the main character in this film, he is part of the Union? Yes. Is that the right term? And the Union represents... The North. The North... And they represent, like, politically, what, I, I don't know where that is. Because like, nowadays it gets muddled with who is who. Yeah. I, I don't mean, like, Democrats and Republicans are not into that side of it. I just mean more towards why were they fighting? I still, like, it, it's something to do with slavery, I believe. It stems from that. Yeah, I mean, there was... There was uh, various issues, but the abolishment of slavery was a big one, and that's something the North was fighting for, was to end slavery. So the North were pro-ending slavery? Yeah. Right. Okay. Right. Well, I, I suppose that sets up the stakes of the battle, but I, what I'm trying to get my head around then is the people that they're fighting, the, the bandits or the Jayhawkers, was that what comprised the, the South's army? Or were they a, another contingent? I don't know. <laughs> um, yeah, th these are things I, I feel like there's like a built-in knowledge to Americans. Yes. To watch this film, like they, they have the context to understand it without asking questions. But I, And that's something probably we'll get into in the review. I feel like it, it's, uh, it, it's not as easy for people outside of that bubble to understand. No. Um, in terms of like, I've always seen it much more as a North versus South. Like, that's kind of what I've known it as. When you start getting to, when you start throwing around the word Jayhawkers, I'm like, ah, okay. <laughs> well, you, you look at a British Asian, something we, we've covered recently, that has title cards interspersed in the film to kind of give you a tiny bit of context. You know, the Bolsheviks and things like that, you know, Lenin, what's going on? Whereas this film, it literally just relies on the fact that you know everything. Right. Yeah. Uh, I'm just pulling this up. So the main Confederate armies were um, from Virginia and Tennessee. 
I see, according to Wikipedia. So that's something. Okay, and then I suppose that plays because Gary Cooper's character is from Virginia, yep. but is fighting for the Union. Correct, yeah. Okay. We're trying to help you here, folks, because we struggled. But, uh, Cam, do you have any more in the background of this film? Sorry to take a, oh, a no, no. diversion. So, um, yeah, Andre de Toth, the director, um, he, as I said, would go on to do a, a lot of westerns. He did a lot of crime films, but House of Wax was his big thing before he just moved into TV later on in his career. But he has two credits that are going to be very exciting for spy fans. Numero uno. He was an exec producer on Billion Dollar Brain. <laughs> what a strange connection. I wonder how he got that exec producer credit on that. I know, because exec producers basically do nothing. So mm. I'm just wondering how that happened. Was Did, did he like contribute an idea at some point? Or? or did they want him to direct it and he passed it off to someone else? Or who knows? That one's a little yeah, bit maybe lost. he was working on the concept for like a month or something and handed it over. Yeah, I don't know. So um, maybe... Okay. That's some spy work for people out there to figure out what Andre de Toth actually did on Billion Dollar Brain. But also, he did some uncredited second unit shooting for a James Bond film. He filmed the uh, Aqua Troops dropping into the water in Thunderball. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, that, that's missing from our Patreon commentary. Sorry, folks, if you, if you listen to that. So he... He came on and shot that one sequence. Yeah. That one part of the one sequence. It's not even the protracted underwater stuff. It's them It's them jumping like into the water. Bailing out of the plane. Oh, right. Oh, okay. So it's like the aerial stuff. Yeah, and then ju- them jumping into the water. Huh. Okay. Yeah. So he was going on for quite a while then. That's the 50s, that's 60s. Yeah. yeah he had Fair a decent enough. career, um, for sure. And... We should also talk a little bit about the actor, Gary Cooper. This was, a, in terms of where it landed, a very um, notable film in his career. Because in 1952, the same year, he had put out a movie called High Noon, which was a phenomenon. He would win Best Actor for High Noon at that year's Oscars, marking his second Oscar win for Best Actor. He'd previously won for Sergeant York in the 40s. And um, High Noon was a massive, massive Western, and also kind of a lightning rod. I talked about it, I think, in our Big Jim McLean episode where it was viewed by many critics as being un-American because it was about a you know proud sheriff who has a bunch of outlaws coming to his town, tries to rally help from the townsfolk, and the townsfolk all turn their back on him. So it's one man against these you know incoming outlaws. And at the time, there was a lot of critics, John Wayne included, who I talked about in Big Jim McLean, who were like, this movie's un-American, that these these citizens would not stand with their sheriff against you know this coming threat. There was a lot of debate for years on end about High Noon and what it meant within you know American film, and it's one I think is one of the most screened films actually in the White House, I believe to this day. Which I kind of believe it's you know one man standing up for what he believes in. It, it kind of makes sense. I, I get it, <laughs> but uh, it's a it's all I ever watch. Exactly, High Noon is what Scott watches on a loop. But High Noon is a fantastic movie, one I would really recommend. I actually went to a 24-hour film fest, oh, a handful of years ago, and that was the movie they closed out the 24-hour film fest with, was watching High Noon. Please tell me the the last showing started at midnight or lunchtime at 12. The last, it would have started at 8.30 in the morning, I That's think. a missed opportunity right there, isn't it? Yeah, it ended at 10 a.m. They should have ended it at noon. That would have been glorious. Yeah. That's like uh, n- only a few people in the crowd would have got it, and they would have been like, "Well done, programmers." You well do done. that, and then you set off fireworks right at noon, and it's just and like then, then you start playing boom. the Star Spangled Banner or something, <laughs> whatever it is. Even in Canada, <laughs> the Republic music, yeah, yeah, sure that one. <laughs> so um, Gary Cooper at the time was under contract to make this movie, and he was not enthusiastic about making it particularly. Um, he really apparently felt that. Anything he did after High Noon in terms of a Western was not going to be that great. And so he just was feeling kind of cynical about the project. His personal life was also in a chaotic state. Uh, Gary Cooper had a very eventful personal life. Um, and Welcome to the team. Yeah. <laughs> and apparently, while shooting this movie, he um, spent a lot of time with uh, Jack Daniels and giving daily Shakespeare uh, performances for the uh, cast and crew. So... Um, 
he must have been an interesting character. It took me a minute to figure out what you meant by spending time with Jack Daniels. Oh, yeah. I've never heard that turn of phrase before, and I'm going to use it again. <laughs> this, ve- this summer in Vegas. <laughs> <laughs> Where's Scott been? Oh, he's been spending time with Jack Daniels. Yeah. Which makes sense, because I'm getting married in Vegas, so uh, I'm going to need a bit of Dutch courage. <laughs> So this movie was mostly show, uh, shot in Lone Pine and Mount Whitney, California, despite the fact uh, it is not uh, set in uh, California. It's set in Colorado, but it was shot in California. Um, apparently, shooting stopped for one day after an atomic cloud appeared in the horizon um, from a nearby uh, Nevada bomb testing. Apparently, they'd set off eight devices. And um, yeah, different time, different time. <laughs> well, as long as it doesn't happen to us in Vegas this year, that's all I'm going to say. Exactly, exactly. We should go to the Atomic Museum, though, they have in Vegas. How have we never gone? I don't know. It's like one of those things. We've never gone to the Neon Museum either, to be fair. But luckily, that's where part of the wedding reception is going to be. So. Okay, cool. We've never been to the Hoover Dam. I don't know. Yes, we have. I've never been to the Hoover Dam. We stopped there for the casino next to it. Yeah, but we never actually did the tour of the Hoover Dam. It's just a block of concrete. What do you want to see? Sorry, Hoover Dam enthusiasts. <laughs> Anyways, <laughs> um... This was a little trivia note. It's kind of meaningless, but I thought I would just mention it to bring back the horse hards theme that began very early on in this podcast. So at the time, there was a horse named Wildfire that was um, very notable for starring in a movie called The Lion and the Horse in 1952, the same year. And that horse, the title horse, was uh, played by an animal actor named Wildfire. And apparently Wildfire appeared in this film. So I've seen various reports. Some say it's Gary Cooper's horse in the movie. Some say it's not. Um, So if you want to put on your binoculars and try to find wildfire in this film, go nuts, people. I could could just see that the sort of cheesy 50s, 60s credits version of this film where it's like starring Gary Cooper and Phyllis Thaxter and (laughs) Wildheart. And introducing wildfire. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, wildfire, sorry. Yeah. (laughs) I hope you all appreciated my horse impression there as well. So <laughs> this movie um, made $4.9 million that year. So it was a decent hit because its budget back in those days probably would have been like $1 million, Maybe. I, even two seems high. So I think this was a, you know, a, a modest success, but a success nonetheless. So the top three for this year, number one was The Greatest Show on Earth, which did win the Best Picture. It was a circus drama that uh, probably hasn't aged that great. I did watch it back in the day and found it somewhat amusing. Um, Number two was The Snows of Kilimanjaro. And number three was High Noon, which I referenced earlier. And uh, just a final note, you know, this movie came out in 1952, as I said, but Gary Cooper did not live that much longer. He died um, just nine years later in 1961. Um, in his early 60s from prostate cancer. But he was a just complete legendary actor, one who's very beloved to this day. Uh, so it's it's notable. Like, I don't think we're going to cover Gary Cooper very much on Spy Hards, but um, definitely a notable icon. It's, it's strange because he's obviously the star of this film. Yeah. But I'd never heard the name before. But I get the impression from his IMDb he did a lot of work. So hearing that he died quite young kind of makes sense. Yeah, like Gary Cooper's, a a lot of the movies he's made that were classics, I don't know that, I don't want to say they haven't aged well, but it's more in the sense of like, I don't know that they've kicked around the cultural consciousness as much in, Mm -hmm. you know, the years that have come forward. Like High Noon for sure. High Noon will go down is probably his most iconic film. But like, I think of him playing Lou Gehrig in Pride of the Yankees, um, where, you know, that's a just incredible performance. Um... I've seen him in a number of things. I watched a movie just the other night called Man of the West, which is a Western as well. A very, very dark Western. One of the darkest Westerns I've ever seen that is really fantastic and features him as a sort of former outlaw kind of reckoning with his life of violence. So he's a guy who has a pretty extensive filmography. Sergeant York, as I said as well, I think is one that would be probably more watched by American audiences than, you know, Canadian or British audiences, but Sergeant York is a good film as well. But uh, definitely has a filmography worth diving into, but not as many of those big marquee titles. You know, you look up Cary Grant, Humphrey Bogart, other actors of that kind of era, there's going to be at least like three films you're like, I know all of those. That makes sense. Uh, it sounds like there's a couple to tackle uh, at some point. I, I will probably try and make time for High Noon if you say it's that good. Yeah, yeah, High Noon's very good. Well, as this is 
a podcast, you can't see. But what I'm doing right now is signaling to Cam with my mirror that it's time to start talking about this film. So, Cam, you first. It's your first time. Springfield Rifle. What do you think? Yeah, so I was a little nervous about this one. I will say right off the bat where it was a lot of like loving shots of the Springfield Rifle. And, you know, a little bit of contextual um, notes here. Like, I was watching this the night of the Texas shooting in the U.S. And so, like, that's kind of heavy, um, you know, at a you know elementary school. So it's like, okay, I'm not really sure that I'm that ready to watch a film that's, like, worshipping the power of the Springfield rifle. Thankfully, that stuff was sort of backgrounded. It really only features into the last handful of moments of the movie where they're talking about it bringing Union to America, and I'm like, oh, okay, <laughs> that ain't great. But I did find this film actually really just very watchable as a espionage western, which there are so few examples of. There's like really none. I, I can think of there's a Disney one we're going to tackle later down the road. Um, Buster Keaton's The General would sort of count in that regard, but not like this, where it is a pure studio western movie made during this era where westerns were so popular and i found in terms of the storytelling some of the um some of the convoluted espionage stuff got a little confusing at parts but the novelty of the movie carried me through where i just found myself very interested in seeing a story we're familiar with we've seen a ton of movies about people that go either undercover or on some sort of secret agent mission, and then the people who are there to kind of um, essentially clarify who they are and what their purpose is start getting bumped off, and it feels like it's a helpless situation and they're going to be trapped. And that's kind of what this is doing, but within the framework of very classic Hollywood Western filmmaking. So in that regard, I found it very interesting. It was one where, look, this is not an all-time Western, but it's one I genuinely enjoyed watching. Yeah, that's actually interesting because it's very similar to where I came down on this film i i I wrote down it's rather paint by numbers in terms of the actual plot what happens it we've we've seen this a million times on our 90 odd films so far but the actual story itself is a really fascinating one the the concept of the first counter espionage agent that works for the union and 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 all that goes with it because i've not seen many westerns I think generationally, I wasn't born in the time where westerns were really idolized as much. I was watching a lot of 80s movies and 90s movies when I was growing up. But I'm aware of westerns. I've seen a few. And so seeing... I I would never have combined espionage and westerns, although I've now coined the phrase uh, westpionage. I like uh, it. Yeah, we'll we'll be using that again, hopefully. Uh, I'll put it on a t-shirt. But yeah. I liked what this film was doing. I liked the story of the idea of having to go behind enemy lines in a sense and and stop the this uh these jayhawkers from stealing cattle and the cattle and the and the gun were the most important thing to for the union to prevail. I had some problems with it which I'll probably get into, but overall again much like you I enjoyed the concept behind it and I think its delivery was was mostly fine. It probably just doesn't stand out to me too much apart from the concept. Yeah, I think one of the things that holds it back for me is that the great westerns, the ones that people look at again and again, have like very strong themes or messages they're imparting or something. This one is very plot focused. Like it's about tracking the plot of, you know, the uh, Gary Cooper character going undercover and emerging victorious in the end. Whereas like when I look at a lot of the other westerns that I really love, they may have a plot that you can describe the way I did that one, but there's a larger meaning to it. There's sort of a richer text to it to analyze. That's not the case with this one. It's very just plot focused. So it doesn't have that kind of, I don't know, it, there's there's just not as much depth to it. But in terms of being like this western espionage movie, I found that just really interesting and you know fun to dive into. Yeah, I, I completely agree. And I think depth or lack thereof is probably the correct way of looking at it. Because for me, it's a sense of... Well, that we mentioned the wife character, uh, play, Aaron Kearney, played by Phyllis Thaxter, I believe is how you pronounce the surname. Yeah. She gets a terrible run in this film. It's pretty bad. Uh, we can talk <laughs> about that more later. But it it 
it sort of toys the film toys with the idea of having these different like themes to it and the consequences of your actions because their son goes missing because they the son finds out that the dad apparently is a deserter and a traitor and whatever term they use in the film sorry a turncoat anything like that uh, and from the shame he runs away and joins the army to sort of try and restore the family name but this is barely mentioned in the film. It's it's set dressing, it's window dressing. It's not really paid any mind. What your focus is on is the plot, which is you know the, the spy story, which we like the concept of the spy story, just maybe not its delivery so much. And I think I'm not going to bang on about the screenwriter. I'm not going to bang on about the director. I don't know them very well enough to make jokes about them. But I feel like there was probably something more here that could have been finessed. And this may be more of a remembered film. Yeah, and I think... For spy fans, there's novelty there. Like, just the yeah. fact, you don't often run across a spy film where it's about uncovering where they're hiding, like, a thousand horses. Like, the uh, the ramifications of the mission are actually really interesting in that regard. Like, they are so steeped in Western mythology that that's where, to me, the fun came from. I just wish there had been more to chew on. When we talk about other spy films of this kind of ilk, not Western ones, but other spy films... Usually there's kind of like a deeper meaning. It's saying something about, you know, the countries involved or something along those lines. Mm -hmm. There's a little more there. Whereas here, when it had Gary Cooper initially being sent out as a turncoat and falling in with the, uh, you know, these um, Jayhawks or whatever, these bandits who are stealing horses, there was never a single moment where I doubted whether Gary Cooper was on the straight and narrow for the North. Like... That's kind of speaking to him as an icon. It's like you never buy for a second this man could be corrupted or portrayed on screen as untrustworthy. Like, clearly he is going to wind up on the northern side helping save the day at the end. I, I think it would be interesting to remake this movie now with an actor who had a little more ambiguity to him because you might actually question his motivations. Whereas with Gary Cooper, I know I knew immediately what the uh, the full story of this was going to be. I agree with that, and I can—I mean, I don't have as much Gary Cooper history as you do necessarily, but I—I I can see he's that Hollywood hunk hero, like the star. Um, and so yeah, I—I I, I also had the same reaction that I knew he was going to fall back into line. It was, and, and the film really sets it up by having the chap come to town and say, "Hey, we need a spy," and then the the general goes, well, "Okay, do it, but don't tell me." And then a few scenes later, this guy, you know, Gary Cooper, becomes a turncoat. You're like, "Wow." Well, He's going to infiltrate, right? And then two more scenes later, you find out that's exactly what's happening. But you can push that away because I and I agree with what you said. And, and obviously we'll get to the knock list later, but there's an interesting idea here. And I think spy fans, spy movie fans specifically, this is probably something to look at because it's, and this is why we're tackling it, is because it's something different. It's off the beaten path. It's not just another bunch of men in, in a boardroom with a mahogany table. There's horses lots of horses um and there's no martinis to be seen it's it's a it's a completely different take on the spy story yet unfortunately to portray that story it really does go by the same formula that we've seen many times yeah it does though as you said like it kind of sidesteps a lot of those cliches that sometimes bore the hell out of us when we're watching these movies like when we did um oh my god what was it the the one with the guys at tables forever operation something um uh crossbow crossbow thank you yeah like that movie had endless scenes of people at tables just talking and i'm like oh my god will this ever end these sections whereas here it kind of doles out its exposition very efficiently i think it does take a little bit of active watching like we've watched some movies on this podcast where you can kind of just sit back let it wash over you like i was never lost during triple x I understood where that movie was going at all times. And we were that, lost, but in other ways, like our soul. But that should be the case for like a triple X or like some of these more blockbuster spy films we've covered. Um, you know, spy kids as well. But like this movie, there was definitely points just being someone who's not as <laughs> locked down with their American history as, you know, some others might be where I was like, hold on, hold on, like trying to figure out the shifting loyalties and you know, they would drop more information with maybe like a slang term I wasn't particularly familiar with. And it would mm -hmm. take a second to be like, hold on, where are we now? Because you do have this character, um, you know, Colonel John Hudson, 
who is ultimately the one that is uncovered as the mole within the North. Um, he's played by um, Paul Kelly. And like there was scenes where Paul Kelly was exposed, but having conversations with Gary Cooper where I wasn't clear exactly what side he was speaking for in that moment. Yes, I had the exact same experience with that scene. Yes. And so it was like moments like that took some actually active watching where you're kind of like, okay, hold on, I need to kind of track this. And I don't mind that in spy movies. We've watched a number like that. They're actually very satisfying to watch. This one doesn't reach the heights of, you know, a Tinker Tailor Soldier Spy or something like that. But um, Funeral in Berlin. Funeral in Berlin. Yeah, there you go. But um, I found it just kind of, I don't know, like this one just had such a vibe to it that was so different than anything we've ever covered and probably will cover. This And this is uh, yeah, a little bit of patting ourselves on the back for a second. It's kind of why I love doing the show, because ultimately I, there's, there's other shows out there and you can listen to them talk about Bond every week or like Jason Bourne, Bond, Mission Impossible, Jason Bourne, Bond, Mission Impossible, repeat, repeat, repeat. And yeah. that's fine. If you can keep doing that every week, that's fine. But I would get bored. I would honestly get bored talking about that every week. I There's only so many times I can make a joke about martinis so this is a western film they're riding on horses and doing exposition about spies you don't (laughs) get that anywhere else no you don't and even just like working in the classic western stunt sequences having Mm. wagons bailing over and big you know like shootouts at the end or just like um you know the fist fights it's working in all these kind of tropes of the genre into a very like classic spy narrative so interesting to watch yeah uh well okay let's get to likes things that we did like because we we, we've taken a couple of shots at it already i'm gonna say gary cooper's back must hurt after filming this for carrying this whole damn film because uh, i mean it's built to be you know based on him it's his film yeah but he really is the only performance i would say that will stick with me really Interesting. Okay, so like, what was it about him versus anyone else? I think it's just that leading man charisma. He, the camera is drawn to his face at all times, as it should be. It's a very handsome face. But somewhere in there, I could see the complexity of a man who didn't want to be seen as a turncoat and having to play that role for, for the union. And th- there was a subtleness there I, I, I found, especially in our second watch when I was paying more attention. Um, yeah, I, I just think he was the most magnetic person on screen. And you a lot of the time, the rest of the actors could have been replaced with anything or anyone. And like Gary Cooper, someone, he has that kind of steely resolve. You buy him as your frontier lawman or voice of justice in these movies. But at the same time, he has these kind of melancholy eyes. So when you have him you know, painted as a turncoat and kind of living this life of shame, you really buy it in his eyes. And then when you're on this spy mission with him and it seems like, you know, all of his contacts are getting killed off. So Mm -hmm. who's going to actually confirm that he is working for the North at a certain point? You don't know. It feels like it's kind of helpless. You can see the vulnerability in his expressions as well going through this. Like there's a real sense of tension. Yeah. And you just think like, I had this down as a separate like, but it really just sort of roll into it. The the heartbreak, uh, I mean, me and you both knew quite early on that he was working for the side of good the whole time. But the heartbreak of having everyone turn on him so quickly and like being thrown out of the the army base, painted yellow. Like that's uh, for someone who whose identity revolves around being in the army as it appears his does, because that's all we have to go off is this 90 minute film. It it's quite a harrowing experience, and I think that's portrayed quite well, um, even though he is lying the whole time. So I would say I really enjoyed his his performance. It's my only time I've ever seen Gary Cooper, but uh, it's made me eager to see more. Let's put it that way. Right. There was two performances that jumped out to me that I really enjoyed, in addition to Gary Cooper. Um, one of them was um, Lon Chaney Jr. as um, Pete Elm, the. Uh, <laughs> kind of (laughs) rough around the edges jayhawk who he um often butts heads with the one that they have like the fist fight where he like slashes (laughs) lon cheney's butt (laughs) the bum slasher (laughs) the bum slasher (laughs) lon cheney's just one of those actors mostly a b-movie actor he played he famously played the wolfman 
um, in the classic Universal Horror film. He also did a lot of Universal Horror stuff. He played Frankenstein once. He played, I think, The Mummy a couple times. He was all over the place in those movies. But um, He was also in High Noon. High Noon, yeah. He's just one of those character actors that I think injects just so much, like weird charisma in everything he does that guy pops up i instantly remember him in the movie and i'm always kind of tracking him throughout the other performance i really liked was um philip carey as captain edward tenick tenick is the guy who's painted initially as the union soldier that is going to be very much looking down on gary cooper throughout and then we find out that tenick is actually involved in this caper they're going to pull and supporting Gary Cooper. I kind of liked these two's back and forth. Um, I can't say Philip Carey is like an all-timer in terms of the charisma department, but I thought he grounded that character in a way where you initially hated him, and then you're like, right on, man, when he's helping take down one of the villains, McCool, in a you know a big shootout sequence. I, I can't say much about Philip Carey. I, I know who you're talking about, and yeah, he definitely does pop, but... It makes complete sense that you would uh, gravitate towards Pete Elm. Yeah. You, you like your outsider characters. You like people you resonate with. Yeah, totally. Now, I have a question for you, a plot question. So, oh, no. Yeah, I know, right? Um, Tenek, at a point, is on board with this espionage mission and aiding in it. At what point is that? Because there are questions... This is what I was tracking in my second watch. And this is where I think my second watch always comes in handy, especially when you've got these deep, complex spy stories. And it's weird saying that this is a complex spy story, but it does. Because just for some context for people as to what we're talking about, early in the movie, there are these um, horse missions that the Union is running to recruit horses that are being you know, broken up by bandits and the horses are being stolen. And Gary Cooper is escorting this group of horses through the mountains and the bandits show up, and Gary Cooper does not engage in combat. He lets the uh, the soldiers, or sorry, he lets the bandits take all the horses. And he is obviously court-martialed for this. This leads to the shame. And one of the big opposers in that entire sequence is uh, Tenek. And then Tenek is the one who files the charges against him and has him booted out of the Union. Later, Tenek goes on a mission where apparently 50% of his men are killed engaging in battle with the raiders, and he comes back in shame. And um, and then uh, Gary Cooper's character picks a fist fight with him over this and is ridiculing him for, well, not so much ridiculing, but criticizing him for losing 50% of his men in battle. Now, it seems like a very uh, sensitive situation for someone who's just emerged from a battle where they've lost 50% of their people to then be yelling at them on the street. But that's what Gary Cooper's character does. And so th at that point, I'm going, wait a second. When exactly is Tenek involved in this mission? My only assumption, based off a line you hear later on, that, that he, he purposefully led the fight into the base to get the Major Kearney arrested. My only assumption is a conversation took place after the Captain Tenek character recommended the major for court martial and then a conversation happened off screen where um the lieutenant colonel hudson who turns out to be the turncoat uh no that wouldn't make sense there's another guy that's in command that comes to the base that asks about being a spy right before this i assume there was a conversation had off camera with that chap and the major and the captain about what he wants and allow the trial to go ahead and him to be found guilty and to use him as an agent. But I would I find it weird that they wouldn't involve the Lieutenant Colonel Hudson in that conversation. It's mainly just so the plot can lead to the point where he is the one who's turncoat. But yes, it's stuff like this that also I think holds the film back is the fact that me and you are trying to figure out a film that's 70 years old. Yeah, because if you tell me that like Tenek is involved earlier on it doesn't make sense it doesn't make sense why he would be leading his people into battle against these raiders losing 50 percent of of his you know soldiers and then being like having gary cooper engage in like a quarrel with him in the street immediately after this battle like things like that don't make any sense and also the next battle that Tenek goes into the major knows that the the bandits are gunning for the captain 
and allowed himself to be shot. Yeah. Which, I mean, no one would allow themselves to be shot. No, no. So, yeah. Confusing, sure. Can you just turn your brain off and enjoy it? Maybe. Um, There are problems with it. I don't think we can make sense of it, and I have watched it twice. Yeah, I think it gets muddled in terms of where allegiances lie. And it's interesting because it is like a movie in theory, like the allegiances would be very clear, you would think, generally in a Civil War story, but this one obviously muddies it a lot. I I have to feel like they have the whole Jayhawks thing, these people that are kind of a neutral party, the bandits, um, I suspect is because they don't want to turn off the audience. Uh, They don't really portray many Southern spies in this movie. You can say, obviously, that, um, that, um, you know, Colonel Hudson is a spy. Um, a mole in the north but like there's even a line where they mention like the good soldiers of like the gentlemen soldiers of the south and they say they're not like the uh the bandits here you know the bandits oh they're like the no good nicks and what all that sort of thing so you can kind of tell it's very much a western film trying to appeal to a broad audience versus uh you know coming down one side or the other i think this uh just just to wrap this bit up i think it's just a case of a film wanting to have a twist because it's a spy film, but the the character they choose, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Hudson, to be the turncoat, when you think about it and extend that argument out, doesn't make sense. No. Because he should be included in this plan, and he would then have involved the captain. It would have all made sense. But because they've excluded him, whereas there's been no suspicion laid down it was him, that doesn't make sense anymore. And, and I guess, in a sense, the form, film falls apart. But... I don't think you need to really, you know, latch onto that small mistake. No, no. It's the sort of thing like the, what is it, the Alfred Hitchcock icebox yeah. theory or whatever, where when the movie's over, you walk away and go, wait a minute. Because that was, for me, it was my final note I made, basically as the credits, or I don't think there were end credits, but the point where the end credits would roll, um, I made a final note of, wait a second. Tenek, when did he know about this? Like, because it was kind of the thing that hung over the movie, and at the very end, I was like, "Hold the phone, wait a second, I don't know if this makes any sense." So that was kind of where that rang back for me. But um, just in terms of positive, something else I thought, like, you know, Andre de Toth, very you know accomplished journeyman and uh, director, staged some of the western stuff really well. Like, there was a whole sequence with um, where the um, the the bad guys, the bandits are all essentially hiding in the brush and they're like, let's smoke them out. And you have like sequences where horses are pulling like flaming hay bales. Uh, I'm sure that horse really signed up for that job, but uh, (laughs) there's a lot of that sequence is really well shot and effective. And it has that sort of escalating danger as like you see more and more fire appearing in sort of those, that, you know, brush areas, the bad guys are all running out and some really good horse stunts. There's a moment where like Lon Chaney gets, you know, shot and dragged by a horse, like through mm. a creek and everything. I was like, oh, cool. Like seeing some actual Western stunts uh, show stuff. No, that was one of my uh, likes as well. I just thought that the stunt and action work was, was really good. I wasn't expecting it to be quite so uh, good. I think one of the things that helps, and it's also another one of my likes, is the film is shot in a very sort of, it was a very beautiful looking film. Like the colors really pop for a film that was made in the fifties. I think it was made in like Warner Vision or something like that, some sort of uh, cinematography standard. I looked that up. So Warner Color, because when it said Warner Color, I wasn't particularly familiar with that. When I hear like yeah. Technicolor or Vista Vision or things like yeah. that, I know those. Warner Color was basically just the new, uh, I think Eastman Color process, but they gave it the nickname Warner Color for only a couple of years, like fifty two and fifty three or something. Sure. Oh, well, it it just really pops. Um, it is interesting, actually, going back to what you said, though. You you, you said it was the bandits fi- throwing the flames into the thing, but it's actually the other way around. It was actually the good guys. Yeah, sorry, the good guys were the ones smoking out the bandits. Yeah, yeah. It just it just goes to show that this film, especially because some of the uniforms look exactly the same, uh, <laughs> can can really confuse you. But yes, I, and and also like a lot of the actual f- fights between the the Jayhawkers and the army with the, on the horses and and sort of that sort of stuff looks really good. And a lot of horse stunts. I don't think I've ever seen that many horses on screen together before in my life. Not in a spy film, that's for sure. <laughs> well, no, not yet. And I'm, I'm glad we finally got our horse hearts. But um, yeah, I, I, I agree. I think in terms of if you're looking for a, a classic, like a 50s film with a lot of cool action, 
this has definitely got that going for it. And it, for a film that didn't have that much of a budget, or maybe that was a lot of money back then, I don't know. It's it's really on the screen. Well, like the thing about westerns was they made so many of them because they were relatively inexpensive. You needed like right. a frontier town. You needed like some horses and, you know, a bunch of stuntmen to do those stunts. And so like there's so many westerns being cranked out. If you look up like the number of westerns coming out in those days, it's just an unbelievable number. And a lot of them are B-movie stuff you're never really going to hear about again. But nonetheless, you could always make westerns on the cheap. Kind of the way nowadays we make horror movies on the cheap because you don't need a lot to make them. Or, or you know, definitely don't need a lot of money or a good plot. Sure. We interrupt this program to bring you a special report. Calling all agents. Independent podcasting, much like the spy game, requires considerable resources. Whether it's research, equipment, hosting, or of course constructing a top secret volcano lair, we're putting out the call for your support. That's right. As you may know, we've activated the Spy Hearts Patreon home of our ever-growing lineup of Agents in the Field episodes where we decode non-spy films from your favorite spy actors and full film commentaries with more intel than a Basil Exposition briefing. Cam, what have we got in our crosshairs this month? Well, Scott, Star Wars Episode One is out now, but soon we're going to track down Hannibal Lecter with Michael Mann's 1986 thriller, Manhunter. And if that sounds delicious then become a true spy hard today and join the circus at patreon.com slash spy but before this message self-destructs cam resume the spy jinx um the only other thing i had for likes was uh, apart from the older uh, not the star spangled banner the whatever the name of the track is but uh the score itself actually shines through quite a lot for me especially the second time i was watching it like it if i notice a score usually it's quite good i'm going to check out who the composer i think cam's looking up for me now it was max steiner is that a known name at the time yeah max steiner was um a fairly uh legendary composer in the time very prolific a guy who worked on a lot of things but he worked on stuff like casablanca treasure of the sierra madre uh, arsenic old and old lace he worked on gone with the wind so one of those reliable hollywood pros who i'm sure could crank out scores like crazy and worked a lot it just it, there was a lot of scenes um that i just felt the music actually added to it which is generally a sign of a good score let me put it this way this man if you look on imdb has 402 uh, music department credits so uh-huh and you know it was a real art like this is not one that would be held up as one of his all-time great scores, but nonetheless, very efficient pro who could, as you said, bring a lot of life to sequences just with music. Absolutely. Um, do you have any more likes for us, Cam? Um, I think that's about it for me. Um, yeah. Okay. Well, um, let's put a bit of that yellow paint on the film and talk about <laughs> a couple of uh, dislikes. We spoke about a couple of them. Uh, you know, uh, uh, probably a bit too much of the old patriotism in this film. Yeah. It's... But then you also got to think like this film is targeted at American audiences. They didn't think about us Brits or you Canadians. We weren't, we want the target audience. It's like making a book for kids and then adults saying, well, this is garbage. Well, of course it is. It's a kid's book. But this is also 1952, which we talked about when we did big Jim McLean. This is right during the red scare era so the House of you know, Un-American Activities Commission and all that sort of stuff. So it's like, it is going to be very patriotic and wear that on its sleeve. So yeah, I, I don't really want to hold it against the film too much, but it does get a little bit overwhelming from time to time, especially when the music starts swelling and <laughs> there's, there's a lot of flags. When that soldier started giving the testimony and the uh, battle hymn of the Republic started playing underneath him, I'm like, oh boy, this is definitely pretty cornball. There's like a there's a protracted sequence right at the end where they sort of reinstate the major and give him a commendation and it's just a lot of like staring at the flag and just watching people parade. Yep. Very very military based film. If you like that sort of stuff, it it's great. It's it's got it all there for you. But if you're not American, it's just kind of fluff. 
<laughs> well, do you remember the end of Big Jim McLean where it's John Wayne doing the voiceover of How Goes the Union, Mr. Webster? <laughs> <laughs> that played in my mind as I was watching like the end of this movie and like some of the sequences in this movie. What, what was the reply to that? Do you remember? Oh, I can't. It, it's from that uh, that Daniel Webster uh, poem or something. But I think it was something along the lines of like, how stands the union? The union st- stands strong or something along those lines. Yeah, it just gets a wee bit heavy-handed but that i i suppose in terms of its target audience they wouldn't really mind that it just for everyone else in the world all the other several billion people probably a bit much um but the one i wanted to take another shot at is the wife (laughs) can i just read a quote from the movie please that is said to the wife by uh hudson this is a man's world out here and you don't belong (laughs) It's like, that pretty much sums up that character in this movie. Yeah, it's a real shame. I don't know the actor who plays the the wife particularly well. Again, a lot of these people are sort of beyond me. But again, there's like potential of an interesting story here because one of the main things that happen in this film is she gives away the fact that he is a spy to the turncoat and basically you know ruins his plan almost. So she has like a major revelation. But it's just because she does something wrong yeah like, there's no agency there like it, it's her fault right but really it's only because it's only because the major didn't give her the correct amount of information but then also like she's written terribly where he comes home the scene before and says don't don't worry darling they found our boy and she's like yeah but who told you yeah but who told you but they, that's not who, what you'd ask you'd be like oh great is he okay but no, 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 the film wants you to, well, it wants to move on to his next plot point, which is him being found out. So it pays no mind to her character. She isn't a character. She's, she's about as one-dimensional as you get. Well, she's an obstacle. Yeah. Her whole role is to be essentially in the way of Gary Cooper accomplishing his mission. And I, I mean, you are my obstacle, Cam. Because a lot of what I say has to get through the uh, editing process, and it, it really doesn't. So... Um, I can understand an obstacle, but I, I just feel it, it's a shame. But then, again, I guess if I contextualize the film at the time, maybe this is just how a lot of female characters are written. But then again, I, I then throw back at myself and I go, well, hey, Matahari was out 20 years before this. And look, it's a female spy lead. You can do it, guys. Just give it a chance. But it's also like even... I can't believe I'm saying something nice about Big Jim McLean, but like Nancy, I think Nancy Olsen was the actress, I think, in that one. But that like, sounds right. Her character had like more agency than this character does. Well, this film, it, it's not even like it's trying to give her anything. It doesn't want to. Yeah. she, As you say, I think that's the perfect encapsulation. She is an obstacle um, between our lead and his goal, which is a shame that they make it the wife and yeah. not like a... Not like a meddling towns person or something like that. Someone, someone you don't have to care about necessarily. Um, what about you, Cam? A dislike? Well, sorry, I do have a note. Phyllis, Ta- uh, Phyllis Thaxter actually has one credit we're both very familiar with. Ooh. Which she was Ma Kent in Superman the movie, the Richard Donner classic. Really? Yeah. So that's, I guess, the one that um, people my age and you know around there would really know her for. Do you know what's crazy? If you click on her bio on IMDb, the trailer for Springfield Rifle plays. Interesting. I would have thought Superman the movie, but fair enough. <laughs> but you can scroll down and like it's not even in her top four. That's so weird. Maybe it's just my cookies. I don't know. It's possible. But yeah, what about you, Cam? Any, any dislikes that we haven't mentioned? Yeah, because we talked about how convoluted some of the plotting gets, which, I mean, that just causes some disconnects there that I think hurt the movie. But um, I thought that um, there was one performance that did not really work for me, and that was Paul Kelly as Colonel John Hudson, who is kind of the villain of the movie, where I don't need him to be a mustache twirler. I don't need him to be more more overt in his villainy, but I just want him to be a little more charismatic because he felt kind of bland in this movie. And one of the um, big unintentional laughs of the movie for me was at the end where this actor who I don't know exactly how old he was, but he was not a young man when he's shooting Springfield Rifle. Um, 
he suddenly turns into a full like 20 year old stuntman during that fight at the end where he like is just taking like huge falls and running down like hills and everything and i'm like this is ridiculous like you did not complete the illusion of convincing me that this somewhat elderly gentleman is doing all of these wild stunts Hey, you don't know. Maybe he's doing calisthenics in his backyard <laughs> at home in between sitting at that desk every day. Paul Kelly is the inventor of parkour. <laughs> he he invented CrossFit, apparently. <laughs> it was originally called Paulcore. <laughs> he was like, watch watch me bounce off a fort set. <laughs> I'm going to run along these horses. <laughs> Yeehaw! <laughs> well, okay, that's the alternate history of uh, Paul Kelly that I think we all want to see. I mean, did you find him to be a particularly interesting antagonist in this movie? No, I saw him him coming a uh, one mile off. I did like that one bit, though, where they're crouched under the rocks, and he's like, they can't quite see each other, and um, Gary Cooper's putting his hat out on the end of his gun to try to mm. get his attention. And he's just like firing and it's like just hitting clicking sounds because there's no bullet in the chamber. And I thought like that sequence had some decent suspense to it. That was like one of the moments where I kind of kind of got on board with the villain character because it's like someone who's maybe a capable undercover operative working, you know, within the the, the union. But at the same time, when it comes to like an action scenario, he's uh, out of his depth. Well, there was one thing about him that I actually did like as well is and to be fair it's not actually him it's just a script giving him something to do but the the way he was giving the intel to the jayhawkers by giving these irregular prices so they could look it up on like a map with the longitude and latitude i thought that was an interesting tradecraft yeah it's not something i've seen done in any spy film so far no that's true and that was what i got out of this movie was just like the approach to espionage in like the wild west was just different like it wasn't i think largely because you had like these smaller communities as well like the way these guys had to operate was entirely different we had to create these like elaborate like ruses to fool people i thought in terms of the movie pulling that sort of stuff off it was it was effective it almost makes me think that the writers of this film were massive spy fans like they knew what spy stories were about but they weren't great at writing other things necessarily so it's almost as if we were hired to write a wespionage film you know we know our tradecraft but try and write a character and we just fluff everything like it's the sort of thing i would be totally down to see in the future like i would like to see like a western spy film like this again you don't have to make it expensive make it a, say it make it a netflix say film. the word <laughs> Westpionage. um thank you i mean you could totally do this on netflix for like a lower budget you know westerns don't cost a lot shoot it in alberta or something like that um you had at the end of this where gary cooper's character is promoted to like military intelligence at washington i'm like hmm. i would like to know what military intelligence is like in you know the year of like the civil war that sounds interesting to me everyone's wearing spurs <laughs> yeah partner <laughs> saddle up to this meeting so yeah i'd be totally down for that movie can you imagine that's like the longest gestating sequel in history springfield <laughs> rifle 2 <laughs> <laughs> like entertainment weekly is like what? what variety like huh there was a part one <laughs> <laughs> yeah because at the time this movie was paul uh... kelly <laughs> <laughs> wait didn't he invent parkour <laughs> Paul Kaur, of course. <laughs> I mean, this movie at the time got very mediocre reviews and was like somewhat dismissed. So people would be genuinely shocked if anyone was making a sequel to Springfield Rifle. <laughs> Stranger things have happened. Yeah. It's interesting though when you go through the reviews, how many are hypercritical of the fact that these Springfield Rifles don't factor into the movie to the last 15 minutes. Like, that was one of the big sticking points for people. Like, clearly, audiences in the 1950s really wanted to see the Springfield rifles factored into the plot. Whereas, like, I don't know what a Springfield rifle is. When I'm sitting down to watch the movie, it's not something that I was particularly focused on at all. I mean, I don't think titles for films have ever really been that literal. Ulrich Goldfinger didn't have a gold finger. But he should have. 
<laughs> I I agree. I agree. Um, but you know what I mean. There was the man with the golden gun. Okay. Did anyone fall from the sky? Um. No. No, that's quite true. That's quite yeah. true. Yeah. Uh, and and Bond clearly did not have any time to die. If, actually, he had plenty of time to die. <laughs> he had all the time in the world. Whoa! <laughs> oh! <laughs> well, just to put the connective tissue on, like I mentioned, my dislike that's connected to um, uh, Paul Core himself uh, is I think they actually showed their hand too early in this film. With both the major Kearney and the villain of the piece... Like I was reading, I looked at the time marks. You find out that the major is hasn't been uh, thrown out. He's actually still working for as a spy at the thirty minute mark. Yeah, this is a ninety minute film, so one third of the way in, your your first big reveal has already been done, and your second big reveal of who the villain is is done at the sixty minute mark. So you have thirty minutes of well, no more reveals. It's just wrapping up the story. And I almost would have liked like the last minute reveal, maybe not like a no way out where it makes no sense, but just like hanging on to the last ten minutes and then finding the colonel at the camp with the Jayhawk and being like, "Oh, I thought he was on our side," and like you just get and then you see like the frustration from the major and like the the shock of being betrayed. Something like that, I think, would have maybe elevated the film a bit more. I was surprised they they played their hand so early. Yeah, because there's another character in the movie sort of the leader of the um the jayhawks um played by um david bryan the character's name is austin mccool and like they don't do a lot with that character but they also give him a lot of screen time mm. and then he's killed by a Tenek. and it's almost like you could have expanded a little more on mccool if you wanted to kind of hide the um paul carey uh, or paul kelly um character a little bit longer yeah that would have been fine. I'm sure you could write it that way. I, I'm guessing it's probably something to do with just being in and out in 90 minutes and not dwelling on anything. But I suppose I don't think I would have needed to have 30 minutes to sit with the idea and, and figure it all out. Like maybe they maybe they weren't expecting audiences to pay that much attention, so they needed to make it very obvious who the bad guy was early on. This is also the era where it's like people just show up at any point during the movie. It's it's not like the strict like start times we have now with movies, in that like you just have people coming in and out of the theater. So maybe they're just like ah, make the villain clear so people aren't confused. Who does that? Who turns up to like? I don't get it. I, I you've ruined so many films by working walking in at like the sixty minute mark. Yeah, that was the big thing with um, Psycho when Hitchcock premiered that movie was he um, had the big cardboard standouts in the lobby saying no one will be admitted to this movie once it started. Oh, really? Yeah. Well, that makes sense. Uh, for Psycho, it makes sense. Good on him. Was that like the start of people paying more attention and coming on start times, or did it take a while for that to really catch on? I don't really know, honestly. And, you know, when you go back to like the 50s and what have you, there would be often two movies because you'd have your A picture, your B picture, you'd have newsreels, you'd have cartoons, you'd have this, you know, a whole bunch of stuff going on. So people kind of walked in and out because you didn't. You didn't have just the movie itself. It's not like you're showing up to see, you know, Doctor Strange 2. The start time is 7.30. Um, you wouldn't really know where it would fall within, like, a <laughs> five-hour block. <laughs> That's fair enough. And also, you didn't probably have to deal with 30 minutes of ads before every single effing film. True. Um, a quick side question. I, I don't know the answer. What do you do? And also, how does it run in Canada? Because here in the UK... If a film starts on the show listings at 7.30, it actually generally means it starts at 7.55 because you have about 25 to 30 minutes of trailers. Is it the same in, in North America? Yeah, same here. It's about, what, 10 minutes of commercials, 15 minutes of trailers. Sure. Do you skip them? Um, I sometimes try to skip the commercials and stuff. The trailers I'll show up for. Um, but by and large, to be honest, if I were to average out all of my movie-going experiences... I am probably on time more often than not, right, what the show time is. I used to be that way, but now I have just started skipping them because I seem to watch so many trailers just on YouTube and stuff now that I've seen them all and seeing them on the big screen isn't really worth it for me. Um, so it's actually saved a lot of my time. It's just turning up 25 minutes late and you literally get in there and the BFFC, BBFC, whatever it is, um, sticker is on there saying this film and it's like, eh, hey, off to the races. Ah, horse pun. <laughs> 
Yeah, well, it's like if you go to the movies a lot. Like, I went to see the movie Men last night, the Alex Garland film. Oh. And um, it's interesting. It was a very a curious double feature I had where I watched Men and then came home and watched Springfield Rifle. It's like the first movie is all theme, not a lot of plot, followed by Springfield Rifle, which is all plot, not a lot of theme. So <laughs> it was kind of an interesting balancing act there. But, you know, that one, I was sitting watching it with, you know, a friend of the show, Tyler, um, who appeared on Diamonds Are Forever. Um, but we saw the trailer for Nope, uh, the new Jordan Peele movie. I think that's about the seventh time I've seen that trailer. So I would be wise to maybe to just skip trailers half the time because I find they just play the same ones over and over and over again too. I would just look at my phone half the yeah. time, I think, if I was there, which is the problem. Um, well, I think I'm out of dislikes discuss. Did you have anything else, Cam? I had a couple of little notes I'll make. You know, true to classic Hollywood, we had a Wilhelm scream in this movie yes i wrote that down too yeah where it was one of the i believe one of the the bandits or something got thrown over a cliff and you got the well uh, wilhelm scream did you notice that they reused the sound effects of them sort of like herding the cat the uh the horses oh i didn't catch that no there's like there was like four or five sound bites they had of people making noise like get up here <laughs> uh, that they just sort of played at different intervals but there was one noise that they played several times that i couldn't figure out what the noise was so i'm going to try and re- recreate it for you okay and i have no idea how this would help corral a horse but here <laughs> and it, well, it, it, it was so weird that it, like it, it stuck out in my brain so nibbly and heap now are what i'm getting out of springfield rifle and paul core and paul core will always have paul core yeah um Speaking of horses, there's that bit where Lon Chaney's character is like holding on to the kicking horse, and I'm like, mm. you couldn't pay me enough to do that job. <laughs> uh, to be fair, the, some of these stunts uh, look terrifying in this yeah. film. Like credit to the, uh, and this is back in the day where health and safety isn't really a thing. Yeah. Um. Yeah. Credit to them. They 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 put their all into this. Well, there was a lot of like stuntmen of that era. It's just like they spend a lot of time with Jack Daniels. And then, you know, they're like kind of these uh, rough and tumble bunch who are jumping on horses, taking falls. And a lot of it is like, boy, what was the safety protocols for your landing? Huh? <laughs> like, I don't know. I just fell. <laughs> didn't uh, didn't uh, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood sort of comment on that a little bit? Yeah. Yeah. He would have. Yeah. The Cliff Booth character would have come from that kind of era. Yeah. Yeah perfect sense well my one of my final notes i had which connects to horses quite well and horse hards yeah we're mentioning that again is this the ultimate evolution of horse hards is this the pinnacle well we the trailer at the time of us recording this the trailer for mission impossible dead reckoning has uh just dropped out a couple days ago and uh i see a lot of horses there so and i also saw a locomotive so it looks like uh this one may go full uh, buster keaton but uh yeah, it looks like we may have some more horses in the future. As someone online recently pointed out all of the uh, similarities between Mission Impossible, the, the trailer, and uh, basically the Bond films. Right. And it's it, it, there's a lot of homages. It's actually quite funny. But um, I'm actually quite looking forward to that as an aside. Oh, yeah. I'm also seeing like nods to the general, which maybe like Tom Cruise is our new Buster Keaton. Like this person that takes on death-defying stunts for our entertainment. Maybe that's kind of what they're going for at this point. So I'm excited for that. I had one other note I want to make, um, which is a small cameo role by an actor at this point early in his career. Fess Parker shows up. He's the guy who, when Gary Cooper first goes and, you know, meets up with the Jayhawks and all that stuff, kind of drops a big exposition bomb on him. He's like, oh, hey, I'm so-and-so from North Carolina. Let me tell you about... And he just goes on for like three minutes, giving kind of background. Do you remember that character? No. Okay, he's kind of like a younger guy, you know, close cropped, you know, brown hair, um, you know, kind of a North Carolina accent, and um, just basically explains how everything works to the Gary Cooper character. He was played by an actor named Fess Parker, and Fess Parker would go on to become one of the gr- huge, huge icons of frontier storytelling. He would play Davy Crockett in the Disney. Uh, initially TV series, and then they would edit those episodes into movies and release them. And the Davy Crockett craze cannot be uh, underestimated um, in terms of how huge the impact was in 1950s culture. It was like um, kids were wearing those raccoon skin hats, and Davy Crockett, the, the song of that show, became a huge hit. And 
Um, it basically made the career of Fess Parker and broke the career of Fess Parker, where he would be so identified with Davy Crockett that he would just play variations of that character for the rest of his career, really. I think Paul Kelly suffered the same fate when it comes to uh, his fitness activities. I mean, spoiler, Paul Kelly actually was the uh, stunt double for Daniel Craig at the start of Casino Royale. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I could just see his mustachioed face running through that wall. <laughs> Makes perfect sense. Get your finger out your ear. Um, well, Cam, I think uh, we better get to the knock list before uh, I take my knife to your bum. So, um, Springfield Rifle, what do you think? I think in terms of the knock list, it's a no for me. We've talked about the convoluted uh, plotting and, you know, obviously the uh, Phyllis Thaxter character is pretty unforgivable. It's more interesting as a novelty, I think, for spy fans because I think a lot of us have watched movies set in the Cold War or kind of the Bondian kind of stuff or the Bourne type stuff. This is something very different where you're going to see a lot of the tropes you recognize in a world that you are not used to seeing those tropes set in. So I would recommend people watch it, but at the same time, as an all-timer knock list, no. I will say, though, watching this movie makes me want to see more very specific genres tackle spy stories. Like, I would like to see the horror movie spy film or various other things. Like, where's my musical spy film? Because this was kind of fun, and I'd like to see more examples of things like this. Well, we might just have a musical spy film, you know, loaded in the barrel, if you know mm. what I mean. Mm. Mm. And to be fair, I, I, I agree, actually. I do like seeing these different genres' takes on spy films because spy movies aren't really a genre. It's like a, a motif. It's like a, it's, it's an element of a story. It's not necessarily a genre. Yeah. Um, and, like, Ghost in the Shell was an anime take on it, but that wasn't, like, a full-on spy film there was a lot of spy elements and that's that's why we covered it but i, I don't think i could put my hand on my heart and say it was a full-on spy movie um so like that's another genre i'd like to see a full-on spy movie as well but um as for the knock list yeah i I don't think it's making it on for me either i think this is a a, a delightful sort of curio when it comes to the spy genre there aren't many you've you've noted a couple more uh, sort of wespionage films down the road that we will mosey on up to but this is our first one I, I think it's an interesting take on it all it's really fascinating to see these tropes that we've seen uh, quite a few times over now in a different setting completely but i, I just think the 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 interesting concept this film has is not delivered it doesn't quite hit the mark so yeah it, it's a it's a no for me too and also like it's the best so far spy film we've seen from 1952 because this was better than Big Jim McLean <laughs> by a considerable margin. <laughs> by a country, by a country mile, yeah. This is. Um, I actually would rewatch this film. Yeah, I don't think you could pay me to uh, rewatch Big Jim McLean. How stands the union? <laughs> we have to get we have to get hundreds more people on Patreon to uh, <laughs> for me to consider even watching Big Jim McLean again. Yeah, there's not been a lot of um, demands for the full Big Jim McLean commentary. There's, there'll be someone out there. Sure. Sign up for the Patreon now. <laughs> call, call us. Yeah, call us. <laughs> we're, not, we're not calling you. <laughs> we work cheap. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, there you go, folks. Springfield Rifle. Despite being a delightful curio that we recommend if you are really into the spy genre to take a look at, it is not a need-to-see official classic. It's not making the knock list. And as such, the dossier on the film is complete and filed as classified. Cam, what are we doing next week? Well, we are going back to Bond. We are tackling the 1983 Sean Connery Bond film, Never Say Never Again. Never? Never. Never say never again. Never. Never, <laughs> never say never again. Yeah, you get the idea. Yeah, we we are going all out for the final official Sean Connery James Bond film. People out there who think it isn't official should check yourself before you wreck yourself. We're going to have two full weeks of Never Say Never Again coverage. Not only have we got 
a review with a fantastic guest. We have two Spy Master interviews for you. On the Friday, we have Dick Clement and Ian Lafrenet on the show to talk about their involvement with Never Say Never Again, as well as their wider filmography and their fantastic work in British comedy. And then the following week, that's two whole weeks of Never Say Never Again, we are joined. And this is a culmination of a, a, a boyhood dream by Barbara Carrera. You heard that right, folks. Fatima Blush herself is gracing the podcast and uh, it's a hell of an interview we go not just in never never again but we fly over to condor man as well don't worry we get your fill of condor man and uh yeah i i still get goosebumps thinking about that chat now it's fantastic so basically we've got two weeks uh tuesday next week we have never never again review uh, that friday we have dick clement and ian Frenet, and the following tuesday we have Barbara Carrera. So, uh, yeah, make sure you tune in. Yes, this is going to be definitely the fireworks at the end of the Connery era. And if you like what you heard on the show, please consider leaving us a five-star review wherever you get your podcast. It just helps spread the spy hard name. And we are, of course, the worst secret agents in the world. So we want everyone to know our name and do not forget to follow us discreetly on social media at spy hards. That's S P Y H A R D S on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, but until next week, Cam, we must have horses, thousands of them.